Okay. Um, so um, in, a, in our series this year uh, about um, ecosystems and uh, people around uh, malware, uh, Beatrice and Lydia are going to, uh, to share some, some thoughts on the, the card shop uh, ecosystem. And you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Lydia Lopez, and I am here today with Beatriz Pimenta. We both work as threat intelligence analysts at Blueleaf at the Threat Actor research team. Blueleaf is a Spanish-based threat intelligence company, part of the Outpost 24 group. And today we will be speaking about the underground car shop ecosystem. First of all, we are going to speak about the different underground car business models, explaining which types of products are offered, how the cyber criminals can cash out to make money, and overall how these markets work. Then we will have a look at some of the most relevant car shops right now, uh, explaining also the methodology we have followed to select them, and also review some car shops that are currently offline, but used to be very important. And lastly, we will share some advice and our conclusions. Uh, so regarding the advice, it will be on how to fight credit card, credit card fraud. Our research interest arose when Joker's Stash, one of the major carding shops until the last year, announced its closure. So we were left wondering how such an event could impact this, this carding ecosystem and also which other, other, other major shops would replace Joker's Stash. So for that, we decided to investigate this ecosystem from the very beginning investigating which different types of markets are out there, also uh, checking in some underground specialized forums for the feedback from, from buyers of these shops in order to see which other shops were rising and, and were going to, to fill the void left by Joker's stash. So there are different venues in which one can find available cars to buy. And depending on the option that you choose, there will be different levels of interaction between the buyer and, and the seller. And so let's see which different venues there are available. First, the automated vending cards, which will be our main focus during this presentation. Um, as the name suggests, it's completely automated. There's no need for interaction with, uh, with the seller. And um, basically, it's that it's a simple choose and buy. The second venue are the marketplaces. Here, different vendors will offer their products, and the buyer can choose from which to buy from. In this case, the reviews are very important to, to see if the vendor is, is trusted or not by the buyers. And lastly, there are specialized carding forums and also chatting platforms, such as Telegram, that, uh, where the transaction is basically manual. In the case of forums, often these have a marketplace section, but that's not mandatory. So um, how a stolen card ends up in an automated vending card or, or a marketplace? There are two main selling sections in car shops one for buying dams and another one for buying CVVs. So first I'm going to focus on, on the dams. These are used to conduct a card present fraud. And the dams are basically payment card information that can be used to create a counterfeit card. And the, the, when we are speaking about dams, we are referring to the back of the card, the magnetic stripe, and it's called track data. So track data contains sensitive information such as the card number, the expiration date, the CVV, and the cardholder name. There are two main ways uh, that threat actors use to get the dumps. First, there is the point of sales malware, which basically infects a point of sales machine, dumps the process memory, extracts the track data, and exfiltrates it. 
And secondly, we have the skimmers, which are physical devices that are laid over at ATMs, gas pumps, and other physical payment terminals, also to extract the track data. And uh, the second section um, that is often encountered in, in the car shops is the CVVs, that are also sometimes known as cards. And in this case, the, the CVVs are used to conduct car not present fraud, so mainly online illegitimate transactions. There are multiple ways how threat actors can obtain these CVVs. Um, it can be through the creation of phishing websites that mimic uh, the, the image of a legitimate um, e-commerce e e site to, in order to steal the card information. Also, there are the, the so-called match card threat actors that compromise uh, e-commerce e -commerce websites created with e-commerce platforms such as Magento or Shopify with JavaScript-based digital schemers. Apart from that, the CVVs can also be obtained from leaked databases or information stealing malware. In the case of information stealing malware, it can be purchased in the cybercriminal underground for as little as $10 per month, as in the case of Bloody Stealer. So once the threat actor buys um, a card, um, a CVB or DAM, how they can make profit from it. There are two main types of illegitimate transactions. There is the card present fraud and the card not present fraud. In the case of card present, threat, present, present fraud, the threat actor is going to use um, a counterfeit card um, created just go into a store and, and pay with it, with information that has been purchased on the store from dams. And in the case of cardinal present fraud, we are referring to online illegitimate transactions, but it can also happen through mail order or phone. So now that we have established the functioning logic behind the card shops, we are going to dive into some major shops that are currently online or offline, but each one of them provides us with an interesting angle uh, that compose a bigger picture of the current status of the card shop ecosystem. And the shops we are presenting today are Brian's Club, Ferrum, uh, All World Cards, and also Riskator. Um, to guide our research, we have established some criteria, so it allows us to compare the shops. So the first aspect that we highlight is the presence of the card shop in forums. So if the card is being advertised in forums, uh, which are these specialized forums? If the threat actor behind uh, the advertisement is, has a good reputation, if they are involved in arbitra arbitration issues, if they um, constantly engage in conversations with other threat actors, and finally also if the card shop is a sponsor, a forum sponsor. The second aspect that we highlight is about communication methods, most uh, with a high focus on Telegram channels. So if a card shop has a Telegram channel to increase uh, the capabilities related to advertisement and communication with clients, that's a good sign. And as a plus, the number of subscribers to a channel can also be a good indicative of how popular a shop is. Uh, the third aspect that we highlight uh, is marketing actions because they allow us to evaluate the assets a shop has and also the exclusive features the shop has. And finally and most importantly, we have the shop's structure per se. So uh, the layout of the shop, how the products are organized, if the shop is automated or not, uh, the communication methods available, and uh, if also they have other interesting features available for the customer's convenience. But before we dive into our analysis today, I wanted to present you with a brief timeline of events that happened uh, ever since Joker Stash closed. So uh, Joker Stash announced their closure in January 2021, but they just closed a month later in February 2021. After three months after that, um, uh, All World Cards came into play with a huge marketing action around it to promote the shop. Uh, in August 2021, 
Riskator was back after a year and a half of inactivity, uh, most probably trying to take back their place amongst the most prominent card shops in the scene. Finally, and most recently, in February this year, 2022, uh, a major uh, law enforcement operation from Russian authorities took down four, four major shops, including Ferrum and Trump's dumps. And amidst this context of law enforcement operation, some other card shops, they tried to keep a low profile, not to be seen as the next one in line to be seized. And that was the case of All World Cards. They announced that they were taking some holidays, um, just to let things go down. Uh, but in the end, they never returned. So probably um, they actually did an exit scam and just used the context uh, as an excuse. Okay, so our first analyzed shop of the day is Brian's Club. Brian's Club is currently active and it is one of the most prominent and long living shops in the card scene uh, nowadays. Uh, the registration in the card shop is free, but uh, users must add, must add balance to within five days, otherwise the account gets banned. And uh, payment can be done in different types of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Litcoin, uh, for the customer's convenience. They also have some interesting features, so pay tools and some free tools. So as an example of a pay tool, they offer checkers, which are used to check the quality of dumps before purchasing them. And for free tools, they offer, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Um, they offer, yeah, bank identif identification number lookup, uh, which is used to validate cards before purchasing them. And additionally, they also have a whole section about education and tutorials about Cardian World to their clients, so they're very nice. And all these, all these elements, they make the shop look more robust and they create a sense of credibility and they make their clients more safe about their purchases. But in terms of products, which is the most important thing, uh, dumps can be purchased in Brian's Club for prices that range between three and 269 US dollars while CVVs can be purchased for prices that range between eight and 84 US dollars. Differences in price uh, comes due to different reasons, but I, if I can say so, most of them are quite uh, intuitive. So for example, if a product has more personal information from the affected customer, it is more expensive. If it is a platinum card over a gold card, it is more expensive. If it's a credit card over a uh, debit card, it is more expensive, and the list goes on. But so as a concrete example, this one that cost 269 US dollars, uh, it was issued by a known bank in the UK. Uh, it is okay for international use. It is a platinum card, a credit card. The expiration date is far away from the current date. So it is highly valuable. While in contracts, the contrast, the one that costs $3 uh, is a debit card uh, with a close expiration date. It is issued by an unknown bank, so it's not really uh, desired. And here we have an example of the dump section of uh, Brian's Club. And as you can see, Brian's Club is a great example of an automated vending card because you can simply use the filters to sort out preferences, you select the desired product, you add it to the cart, and then complete the purchase. There's no need to, to interact with anyone. And as you can see, uh, per the screenshot, there are different um, filter categories such as bank, uh, address, price, uh, and so on, so on. Brian's Club is managed by a threat actor named Brian Krebs, which is not the journalist, of course. Um, but, and they are active in different uh, specialized forums since at least 2015, so forums such as Club 2 Card and Card Villa. And they are active in these shops to interact with customers, promote the shop, and so on. And this is one of the two possibility of communication methods with, with them, and the other one being shop tickets. Here we have an example of a thread initiated by Brian Krebs in a forum advertising Brian Club, Brian's Club, and also highlighted, highlighting the strongest features of the shop, and most importantly, also providing a list of available domains, available and trustable domains, because there are many scammers out there, so this is really important. And uh, threads like this can be found in multiple other forums. Here we have uh, an interesting finding, more of a fun fact. But uh, while I was doing the research for this presentation, I saw that the thread actor behind Riskator, which is a competitor, has been checking Brian Krebs' profile on, on the BPC forum, which means that that 
as in any other more conventional market, uh, competitors are keeping an eye on their peers to keep their shop, their prices, their products up to date. Now I'm going to speak about the Rescator Car Shop, that it's a, competi a competitor of Brian Dams, and it's also an automated car vending shop. This shop was created around 2013. Um, it, it has been very popular until mid-2019, then it went offline for a while, but it came back strong in mid-2021, as we can see, in, in the top of, the, of this slide, Legendary Riscator is back. This is the banner that we have seen in the advertisement in some forums. So differently from, from Brian Dams, in this case, it's only possible to pay with, bit, with Bitcoin, but the registration is also free. They also offered some paid tools, but uh, at not as, not as many as Brian Dams. And the VIP customers can see at dates one hour earlier than the rest of the customers. Here we can see a screenshot of, the, of Riscator. In this case, we can see that they also offer many, many filters. Uh, interestingly, it's possible to, to filter by a specific birthday or a specific phone number. And as Via mentioned, the price will depend on multiple factors. So if the, um, if the information is more detailed, they, they offer more information, it's going to be a higher price. Also, if the card is a platinum card or a, or a gold card, a classic card, it, it will depend on that. And when is the expiration date also will affect the price. So who is advertising this? this car shop. Currently, this shop is advertised by the legendary Riscator moniker. Mostly, this, this moniker has registered in multiple forums uh, in, in August 2021, but we also found the first registration in 2014. And if we go back to the early days of the shop, it used to be advertised by Riscator and, at a lesser extent, Helgern. So at that time, it was advertised in forums such as Lampedusa and other forums that are less popular or inactive. And they, had, they were managing four different shop brands that eventually all merged into Riscator. So for the communication methods, they, they opened different threads in, in specialized carding forums. And Anyone can, can ask questions and provide their feedback there. But apart from that, it's also possible to open a, a shop ticket. So regarding the inactive car shops, there are three, three reasons that explain why car shops um, are closed or are inactive. So the first case is exemplified by Joker's stash, an organized closure. In this case, the operators of the shop will give some early warnings and even sometimes explain why they have decided to close the shop, giving sometimes some time for the buyers to do their last purchase, purchases or to retire their funds from the shop. The second, the second reason why a shop might be inactive is because of a seizure by law enforcement. We have seen this recently because in last February, the Russian authorities took down four different car shops. And the third reason is the most common one, the exit scam. This is the, the first explanation that comes to mind, uh, to mind when, when a car shop is inactive or, or offline. And we often encounter a lot of posts from, from buyers complaining in forums worried about their lost funds. So the first inactive car shop that we want to uh, comment, comment today is Ferrum. Ferrum was a very important car shop since 2013, so one of the oldest car shops. And we wanted to highlight that it used to include a banner of the competitor, Tramstamp, which was also coincidentally 
uh, seized in the same law enforcement operation by the Russian authorities. Here we can see a screenshot of the CBB section of Ferrum. In this case, we see that the design was not very advanced. It didn't have uh, any of the cool features that we have seen, paid tools, and but they offer a high amount of, of CBBs. They offer millions of compromise cards, and also they offer them at affordable prices if we compare them to current offers of car shops nowadays. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, currently All World Card is, is offline. Uh, and it has been so since February this year. And for that, and since the rumors started about the, the exit scam, uh, the threat actor behind All World Cards was banned from several forums, and they were labeled, as you can see here, as a ripper, and the Club Two Card Forum, for instance. But before all that happened, All World Cards had a great reputation because they launched a marketing action, a marketing campaign, in August 2021 that consisted in releasing one million free cards to their clients, because again, they're so nice. And um, I, despite the fact that these cards were compromised between 2018 and 2019, still in 2021, uh, clients were able to find valid cards amidst this, this big list. So this gave a good uh, credibility to the shop, and at least a good visibility, but also great credibility. Um, and we assessed that this one million cards, they were compromised mostly through car not present fraud. So digital skimmers, uh, phishing, and other types of social engineering techniques. Um, okay, so while we research card shops, we often find phishing pages from scammers. And recently, the Blue Live Labs team found a suspicious card shop, and we decided to investigate further. And what we found was hundreds of thousands of domains that were mimicking major card shops in, in mimicking in domain names, but also in layout. So major card shops such as Trump's Dumps, Ferrum, All World Cards, um, Brian's Club, they also, they all had this, their version, their phishing version. And all of these phishing card shops, they were listing the same uh, number of fake cards. And when the client clicked on the receive card section, they would actually be downloading a Clipper malware instead of a free card. And when we analyzed some of the domains of this campaign, we saw that they were registered between 2015 and 2022. So probably this is one major operation that uh, is divided into different campaigns. And uh, the latest one, dated from March 2022, they can be related to the recent developments in the card shop's ecosystem. So the takedowns, the exit scams, and so on. So here we have an example of how the phishing forum shop looked. So the domain name made a reference to forum, to forum, sorry, uh, but the display, it does not look like the original forum, but still, um, I don't know, people might fall for it. Uh, and this is the receive card section. So when the client clicks on the receive card, they are redirected to an onion page to download a file that was allegedly the free card but instead it would download the Clipper malware. And what does a Clipper malware do? Uh, they substitute the desired um, cryptocurrency wallet address for uh, a cryptocurrency wallet address controlled by the threat actor. And this is interesting, this whole campaign is interesting, not only due to the magnitude of the campaign with the hundreds of thousands of domains, but also because we see that scammers are also trying to infect other cyber criminals. So they know their modus operandi and they, they profit from it, um, scamming other cyber criminals. And as the saying goes, apparently it's no crime to steal from a thief. Okay, now that we are headed towards the end of our presentation, we wanted to offer you some brief advice on how to fight card fraud. Um, some are more general, some are more specific. And the first one is more aimed at retailing, and it is the incentive to adopt the 3D secure protocol, which was set in place by card issuers, and they add uh, an additional security layer to online transactions, so both the shop and the client are more, are more safe in these online transactions. The second advice is more general, and it is to stay on top of the latest uh, security standards, such as the global data security regulatory standard. The third advice is also very general, but it is to keep all hardware and software up to date so we can decrease the, um, 
the threat surface and this way we can quickly patch potential vulnerabilities. And finally, uh, also actively scanning uh, physical equipment to try to, to find um, skimming devices and so on. The conclusions that we hope it's now clear for you is that first, the threat actor, the, I'm sorry, the card shop ecosystem is highly fluctuating. So there are many factors that can affect uh, the current status of the ecosystem, such as personal reasons, such as the case with Joker Stash, um, law enforcement actions, uh, political momentum, the adoption of new security policies, the list is vast. And this leads us to our second conclusion, which is the importance of continuously monitoring sources. So not only the shops per se, but also um, uh, forums and telegram channels. So we, as a security community, we can stay on top of the latest developments and, and we can see potential trends. So for instance, future trends is the adoption of CVVs over dumps. Uh, due to the more and more adoption of countries of security chips instead of magnetic stripes. And finally, it's important to see scamming as an inherent part of the ecosystem because um, not only card users are being targeted by, target, by carding, but also other cyber criminals. So we should uh, have this, take this into consideration when we are analyzing, we are analyzing this ecosystem. And that's it. <laughs> that's all for us. If you, it doesn't, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't appear to you. Okay, so, but this is all for us. If you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to reach out to us later or now. We're very happy to, to answer those questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> oh, I thought it was appearing. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Yes. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Julian from Marwebytes. Um, I had a question about these cards uh, stolen and sold on these shops. Do you know if the cards are sold more than once uh, to different uh, buyers? Um, there are shops, as we mentioned before, like um, Trump's Dumps and um, Ferrum. They, they were listing the same, sometimes they were listing the same cards. Uh, but and Lydia can help me with that, but I don't believe they are uh, sold more than once. Okay. I believe it's, or at least you cannot cash out more than once, I believe. Mm. So the shops don't allow to sell it more than once after it's sold, it's gone for other buyers? Or you don't know? <laughs> uh, we haven't various. specifically <laughs> investigated that, but I think it's, it's interesting the fact that Riskator uh, the, sa the same operators were running four different shops, then, and they eventually merged into one. So it, that goes to say that maybe sometimes the same operator can manage different different car shops. Uh, but we have um, we don't we have no evidence to say that the same card is sold more than once. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Mail from Netcraft here. Uh, I was wondering, so your advice doesn't include anything about um, fighting against online skimmers and digital resources like this. And I was wondering if you had any insight about the detection and takedowns of those and maybe like why, why you were not recommending it or if it's just an oversight or you're not um, thinking about this, site, uh, this sort of target here. Yeah, so usual, usually the web skimmers um, are targeting platforms like comic platforms as Magento, Shopify. So here what would like to say is that it's important to always uh, keep updated the, the different ver So if, for example, you're using Magento and they release a security update, that's probably because there, there is a flaw and they have patched it. So um, this is a bit of general advice, but um, um, yeah, that's that that's a way how e-commerces can can protect their shops, and probably there's other advice, but this is what comes to mind now. Hi, David from Proofpoint. Um, I have a question on the uh, phishing campaign targeting the scammers. Basically, uh, do you have any idea on 
the size of the customer base for these shops? And because I was wondering, I mean, trying to scam these scammers is uh, okay. What makes sense, of course, but at the same time, they're also kind of usually. I mean, they're a bit more tech savvy than the random users. They're used to to run the scams themselves. So I I think it's probably less likely for them to fall prey of, of a clipping malware. And at the same time, if, if I were a scammer, I would rather just try to install a clipping malware and set up fake domains targeting crypto platforms that regular users use, because they should have a bigger customer base. So I'd, I'd be just interested in your thoughts around this. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on how sophisticated is the, is the scam. So in this case, we have seen an example where the layout is, is different from, from, from Ferrum or from all our cards. But, in, but when, the, when a card shop goes offline, then if, if the person didn't know the layout that it used to have, it probably can fall for it. And there are more sophisticated uh, scams that probably mimic better the, the layout of, of the original car shop. So, and also we have seen that a lot of these domains um, are actually indexed by Google. So if you don't know the mirror of the original uh, car shop, it's, it's easy to, to find um, the wrong domain, a phishing domain. But yeah, I understand their point of view that probably they don't fall as a scam to scams as often as the general population. Um, but if I can add something, um, there is the level of sophistication of the campaign per se, but also the level of sophistication of the threat actor. So like m minor like criminals, maybe they are not aware of how the how the ecosystem works, so may, they might fall for it. But as, as we said, we haven't investigated the, the in depth that, but that what comes to mind more in terms of sophistication of threat actors involved. Okay, the last question. Great research, yeah, thank you. So I have a question on the cash out avenues. So for, uh, for counterfeit uh, cards, right, they, they can, I assume they cannot use in the chip enabled transactions, right? And if, yeah, these days, the major vast majority of the cards are chip-based, and all the p posts, right, uh, machines are only reading uh, chips, then they cannot cash out anymore, right? Um, so the trend that we are seeing now is that uh, there is much more card not present fraud than card present fraud. And the, the reason, and that's, that's basically the reason, because more and more uh, card, issuer, card issuers are implementing the EMV, uh, the EMB chips, but there are still um, some, some countries and some, car, uh, some, some shops that are still using the, the magnetic stripes. So uh, the, the reason why chips are much more difficult to replicate um, to, to create a counterfeit card is that um, every time there's a transaction, a new code is generated and this is not reused. So yeah, it's much more difficult to replicate, but we'll see in the future uh, if threat actors evolve and get more sophisticated and we see uh, card replication for EMB chips. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.